So hi, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizer for this very nice workshop and also thank everyone here uh, who is still staying here, especially given the nice weather out there. So um, I'm going to talk about um, some application of gravitational observations in cosmology. And um, in cosmology, we would like to try to study the expansion history of the universe. For example, if we are able to measure how fast an astrophysical object is flying away from us due to the universe expansion, or that's the concept of redshift, at any given distance, then um, we are essentially mapping out the expansion history of the universe. The, um, for these two quantities, redshift and the distance, we can relate them. Um, they, they, we can relate them um, based on, depending on the energy density of the universe. And uh, you can try to parameterize this uh, relationship. So this, this uh, equation in the uh, on the bottom of the slide, that is just one way for you to parameterize it. Um, here it includes the matter density, omega matter, the uh, dark energy, omega lambda there, and the h naught, the Hubble constant. And as you can see, the Hubble constant is a very basic parameter that actually set the scale of the expansion rate of the universe. However, the measurement of the uh, Hubble constant is still, uh, we are suffering uh, big tensions between different experiments. What you see here, um, I'm showing the, the one from the cosmic microwave background uh, down by the, the Planck satellite. And also the one uh, the, uh, done from the supernova type 1A um, measurement uh, done by the shoes team. Currently, the um, tensions between these two experiments is as large as phi sigma. So could this be um, a systematic or do we really need a new physics to describe the universe? That is still a big open question in cosmology. And that is where the gravitational wave observation can play a role because we can provide a completely independent measurement of these Hubble constants via the so-called standard siren method. So um, here's how this standard siren method works. Let's say you receive a gravitational wave signal in our LIGO Virgo detector. And you also happen to capture its electromagnetic counterpart. Those traditional telescopes, typically they are able to localize the gravitational wave sources much better than what LIGO Virgo can do. And that's very good localization would allow us to directly associate the gravitational wave source to its host galaxy. Then by measuring the redshift of this host galaxy, we also determine the redshift of the gravitational wave source. On the other hand, the gravitational wave side, it, carry, uh, it directly carry the uh, information about the luminosity distance to the source. It is uh, scaled at the amplitude. Oh, inversely, I said it. Inversely, I said amplitude. So um, now we obtain both of this information, redshift and distance, and we can plug them into this equation we just shown and try to constrain the set of cosmological parameters here. And especially for LIGO Virgo sources, since we are relatively, uh, our observations relatively local, those sources are relatively nearby. All the redshift Z there um, are small. So that means we actually constrain the leading order term, the H naught, the best. Am I blocking the screen? No, great. So um, this approach has already been realized for the first time um, from this very famous event, GF 17, OA 17, and its kilonova electromagnetic counterpart. That solid blue line there, that is the Hubble constant posterior we receive, uh, we obtain from this event. But as you can see, the uncertainty there is still very big. It is still much bigger than the, the tension between the Planck and the Hughes measurement. But we do expect this kind of gravitational wave and the electromagnetic wave joint detections to happen more often in the future. And um, here's the projections. So um, going to the right-hand side is going to the future. 
And the top panel is showing you the number of um, this kind of repetition wave, electromagnetic wave joint detection. That vague green band there is trying to capture the major uncertainty in this estimate, which come from how often did this binding neutron star merge in the past, the astrophysical rate of binding neutron star mergers. And let's say now you combine these um, joint detections, then the bottom is how well you can constrain the H0 measurement from this joint detection. And actually after the uh, LIGO Virgo uh, three observing run at the end of the third observing run, so-called O3, it seems that the astrophysical rate of the binary neutron star merger tends to lie at the more pessimistic end. But even so, we are still expecting a few percent level of Hubble constant measurement only within the um, next few years, which is a very interesting precision because that is a precision that can possibly tell us something about this tension in the Hubble constant. The, there is actually a very similar approach that Satya just mentioned, the one that is not using the electromagnetic counterpart. When you don't have an electromagnetic counterpart, what you can possibly do is that you, for each individual gravitational event, we can provide a localization uncertainty. That's a three-dimensional volume on the sky. And then you can try to account for all the galaxies flying within this three-dimensional volume. You try to measure the redshift of all of them, let's say you have them, then you can try to statistically combine all these possible host galaxies for the, for the gravitational source. In principle, one of them should be the real host. Then after you're doing that for multiple gravitational events, eventually the, uh, the real information, the real um, H naught value should pop up after you combine multiple events. There's a nickname for that that's called the dark siren as opposed to um, the bright siren, the one that's using electromagnetic counterpart. But what I'm showing you here is the projection of how well we can measure the Hubble constant via the so-called dark siren approach. And as you can see, um, we uh, probably don't expect the dark sirens approach to give us um, an h naught measurement that's um, too close to what you can achieve with the bright siren. So that's why um, last few years I've been focusing my work on the bright siren approach, trying to improve its uh, precision and accuracy. If we really want to um, go for this route of um, getting rid of the electromagnetic counterpart, as Satya just mentioned, we probably will need to wait a little bit longer for the more sensitive uh, detectors, say next generation detector. There's a project being um, doing with an MIT grad student, Jeffrey Mo. Uh, we are trying to ask a very similar question as Satya just shown. So we try to ask um, how many very well localized events do we expect uh, in the next generation of detector? And we try to localize the, we actually try to localize the event in the three dimensional vol volume. They actually have very different shape. So for most of the event we found, they actually have a very good two-dimensional localization on the sky, but the distance is not that well. So the localization volume look like a needle basically. So you see many uncertainty needle on the sky. So what we need to do is to try to figure out how big is this uh, volume in, in the three dimension. And then you can ask how many number of um, galaxy is it possibly uh, lie within this volume? Is it, is it too big? Is it more than one? So that's, um, that's a question of single galaxies, whether you can uh, really localize the event so well so that you only have single galaxies lying within this uncertainty volume. And here's just a preliminary result that Jeffrey um, just sent me. Um, so this is the case for the 3030 solar mass binary black holes mergers. Uh, within two gigaparsec. And we found that uh, about 10% of them will be localized so well to uh, be within 100 megaparsec. And that is roughly the, uh, the volume corresponding to one Milky Way light galaxy uh, lying within 100 um, cubic megaparsec. 
And if you then multiply by this 10% fraction uh, to the binary black hole astrophysical rate, that is telling us a similar number that actually Satya just reported. It is order of 10 to 100 of binary black holes merger a year. We would expect for us to directly associate um, the binary black holes mergers to its host galaxy. Then you can use it, for example, to do the cosmological measurement because you can directly measure the redshift. But actually what I would be even more excited about this kind of single galaxy localization without using the electromagnetic counterpart part is that for the binary black holes merger, there is a big question of how did they form? What is their formation history? When you are able to directly associate the binary black hole merger to its host galaxy, then that means you can also uh, try to see whether this host galaxy is early type galaxies, is it late type galaxies? How far away is your binary black hole is lying? Uh, what is offset of the binary black holes lying comparing to the center of the galaxies? All of that information can uh, uh, directly or indirectly point to the possible formation history of the, the binary black holes merger, which is still a very big question and is very uncertainty currently. So with this access of direct association to the host, we might learn something uh, very different. So I would be very excited to uh, learn about this. So that's where we are actually heading to. Okay, so back to cosmology. Oh, too much. Wait. Yeah, so as we, as we just said, this dark siren approach, we probably need to wait a bit longer, but with our current generation of detector, still gravitational cosmology will heavily rely on the identification of the electromagnetic counterpart. Okay, so in addition to this projection of few percent level of H0 measurement in a few years, I was wondering, can we do better than this? And then when you ask this question, so is it possible for us to, for us to improve the precision of H0 measurement? You need to ask, what contribute most to your Hubble constant measurement uncertainty? And then it turns out, it is the distance measurement from the gravitational wave side that dominate the, the entire uncertainties for the Hubble constant measurement. So why can't we measure distance that well with gravitational wave detectors? That actually turns out to be uh, because of this so-called distant inclination degeneracy. So what is, this, what is this degeneracy? For a given binary, the gravitational emission is strongest along its rotational axis. So you can imagine if you have this binary with their rotational axis parallel to your line of sight, that's the so-called phase-on binary as you see on the left-hand side. You compare the gravitational signal you receive from the phase-on binary to an edge-on binary, which means their rotational axis is perpendicular to your line of sight. If everything else is the same, then you would expect uh, your signal coming from a phase on binary to be stronger comparing to an edge on binary. However, if you push this phase on binary further away, then you can easily obtain a signal that looks pretty much the same as an edge on binary that's far away. That's why if you don't know the inclination angle of the binary, then you can suffer from this distant inclination degeneracy. One possibility for us to break this degeneracy is to turn our attention into this new type of source, neutron star black holes mergers. What's great about this type of system is that, first of all, there's a neutron star. This neutron star, it can possibly be uh, tidal disrupt by its companion black hole. And that tidal disruption will allow material being thrown out from the system. Then those material can then power up electromagnetic emission. So this type of system, they can possibly be bright in electromagnetic wave um, spectrum. Another great thing about this type of system is that they can possibly have precession. 
since there's a black holes in the system, that black hole can have certain level of spin, it can be spinning. If the spinning axis of the black hole, the blue arrow there, misaligned from the total angular momentum of the entire system, the yellow arrow there, then um, the system goes through precession. And that precession, I believe um, all of you know that when you have the precession and you cap, you can capture it, then you would um, you actually capture it via um, the observation of some higher order modes in the gravitational waveform. When you capture those higher order modes, those modes, they have different dependencies on the binary inclination angle. So if you capture them, you actually obtain extra information on the binary inclination angle. And that extra information could help you to break the distant inclination degeneracy. Then we can ask, how well, uh, how, how well can we measure the distance for a system with and without precession? And here's a comparison. As you can see, for the system with precession, you are expecting at least a factor of two improvement in your distance measurement. And that factor of two can directly view it as a uh, improvement in your H0 uncertainty for each individual event. So even if this type of system, this type of neutron star black holes mergers with precession, with EM counterpart, doesn't, they, they don't happen that often. Each individual of them, they actually can give you very good measurement of the Hubble constant. So each of them, you can actually view them as a golden event. So you don't really need that many of them to achieve the same kind of H0 precision. What we uh, predict is, uh, what, what we estimate is that as long as the universe can produce one neutron star black hole merger like this for every 10 binary neutron star mergers, then all these neutron star black hole merger combined actually can give you better, more precise H0 measurement than all the binary neutron star merger combined. Okay, so that is one possibility. Another possibility is to uh, try to turn our attention into this electromagnetic emissions. So what you see here is a nice cartoon of, uh, made by NASA for the binary neutron star merger electromagnetic emission. There is the short gamma ray burst, which is very elongated jet. There is also the kilonova emission, which is more isotropic, but still there are theories predicting that these kilonova emission, they can possibly have some sort of structure. So let's say now you try to interpret your electromagnetic observations, your electromagnetic counterpart observations, you can actually try to put constraint on the inclination angle of the system. Just try to interpret those observations. And if you do so, we, we found out that you will need a factor of five to 10 fewer events in order to achieve the same kind of H0 precision if those information, those extra information from EM side is provided. And this approach has already been applied also on the GM17 or 17s observations. But one question you would immediately raise when you hear this is that, well, these electromagnetic emission, they're so complicated, we don't understand them that well yet. So what if your, um, your inference of the uh, inclination angle from the electromagnetic wave observation is not accurate enough? If there is a bias in your uh, inference of the inclination angle, that bias will then propagate to your distance measurement and then to your H0 measurement. And that is the last thing you want, especially for gravitational cosmology. If our major goal right now is trying to say something about this H0 tension, you really want to make sure your systematic is under control. So let's look a little bit, a little bit further into this. Let's say, again, we start with this uh, EM emissions, but we are observing it. Let's assume we are assume, uh, observing it from certain viewing angle. But let's say your interpretation of EM observation is either underestimated or overestimated. And we can conduct this simulation. We can put in some fiducial cosmology. I picked the Planck value to be our uh, fiducial H0 value. Then depending on uh, whether you underestimate or overestimate your binary viewing angle, 
this blue band is what you would achieve um, from what, what you would get from, um, from, from your bias viewing angle estimate. And as you can see, only a 10 degree bias in viewing angle there would push your H naught inference value all the way from the Planck value to the shoes value. So that is, that is a very big bias. So I would say if you really want to use this extra information on the viewing angle from the EM side, you will have to make sure your systematic on the viewing angle estimate is 10 degree, or I would say actually much less than that to avoid this bias. And that can be challenging because again, we don't understand this EN emission that well yet. So you might say that, okay, then if that is complicated and it, there's a risk of inducing systematic, maybe we just don't use this extra information on the binary inclination angle. We only use the redshift information and problem solved. But then I realized that actually, even so the problem is not solved. As long as the EM emission itself has some sort of structure depending on the binary viewing angle, then that means the possibility for you to capture the EM counterpart have a dependency on the binary inclination angle. And then that means the, the samples available or the event available for you to conduct this standard siren measurement would go through a selection. That selection is based on the binary viewing angle. So if you don't understand this selection effect, you don't know how to correct for it. And that will introduce a bias on your H0 inference. So let's look a bit further into this. Again, let's start with this EM emissions, but let's now assume you can say only observe this EM emissions uh, up to some opening angle. And you can define this opening angle, for example, I call it the maximum EM observable viewing angle. And you can imagine the smaller this angle is, that is a smaller cone, so that is stronger selection effect. And again, we repeat this simulation in a fiducial cosmology. Um, let's say now you um, do understand this selection effect, then yes, no problem. You can actually correct for this bias and you, you obtain a very good, there's unbiased H not inference if you can correct for it. But if you don't know about this selection effect, then this blue band is what you would end up with. Again, in some cases, you can easily start with a Planck value, but you end up with a shoes value. So this kind of systematic turns out to be very non-trivial because you really need a, some sort of understanding of the uh, geometry of this EM emission so that you know how to correct for it, which is unclear right now because EM emission is complicated. Um, we can also compare this uh, new systematic identify um, to other known sources of systematic for the standard siren method. Here I just list some of them. And especially the third one, the instrumental calibration uncertainty, that one is long thought to be the major dominant source of systematic for the standard siren method. So what is this calibration uncertainty? It's mainly due to, it's a very rough way of explaining this, but it's due to we are not able to uh, monitor the movement of our mirror inside interferometers that well. So our measurement of the amplitude, our measurement of the phase of the gravitational signal could be off. And here is just some example. Um, in this plot, we are showing the one on the amplitude, the, the bias on amplitude or the magnitude here. In this plot, you would want your magnitude to be one so that your input is equal to your output as a function of different gravitational frequency. However, in our last observing run, we noticed several very extreme cases. For example, this blue, uh, sorry, this green curve is one of the example, a real example that in some occasions, our calibration is not so well. So you either underestimate or overestimate these, uh, your, your amplitude by, by a certain amount. 
And when this happens, you can imagine your amplitude is off. That means your distance estimate is off as well. And that means that when your distance has a bias, that will also propagate to your H0 measurement. And you don't want this to happen. And that's why we are worried about this systematics coming from the instrument. However, with uh, uh, this very recent work led by Eva Huang, another MIT grad student, we work with the LIGO calibration team. And we found out that actually this kind of miscalibration, they don't happen that often. They, uh, they happen maybe 10% or even less than that for, uh, th there's 10% or even less probability for them to really overlap with our future bond neutron sun merger detections. And when that, when this kind of miscalibration, they don't happen that often, that means that when you try to combine a uh, event, here's just going, uh, the horizontal axis is showing uh, how many number of events you are trying to combine, and you try to infer your H0, it seems that your H0 inference is pretty good. It, it doesn't really bias uh, from the, the simulated value, the dash line there. And you should uh, look at the green dot there. That is the one actually with 10% of event were miscalibrated. Even so, you don't see a big bias in that case. So that's great. That means we actually kind of mark this systematic down. And the next one, uh, the, the, in terms of, if you, if you try to compare how big the systematic is, contributing from all these different sources, it seems that the one from the viewing angle could be the dominated one. And that is still uh, currently, we don't know how to resolve. So that is actually our um, next big task for the Bryce Siren method. Okay, so I'll just summary here. Um, gravitational cosmology, as I said, they will likely heavily rely on the identification of EM counterpart with our current generation of detectors. So that means at least for the next few years, EM counterpart will be critical for us. And our next big task will be trying to uh, deal with this systematic associate with EM counterpart observing probability. So that is actually a very rough term. I call it EM counterpart observing probability. There are actually two folded problem here. The one, the first one is your, you, you don't understand your EM modeling that well. So you don't understand, for example, that inclination angle dependency I just talked about. Another complexity comes from the fact that different telescopes, they have different coverage of the gravitational event. They might uh, focus on different colors. Some of them focus on blue, some of them co co uh, cover the redder colors. So all of these choice would affect how likely would you be able to recover or uh, identify the EM counterpart. So how do, you, if you don't account for that kind of selection, then again, you will introduce bias into your bright siren or center sirens measurement. So that is something um, we are still thinking about and see what we can do about it. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Questions? Uh, looks like Sean's got the first one. I might have missed it, but when you were talking about uh, how constraining the viewing angle, uh, how that affects your bias, and, and I didn't hear you say a number of how well you can I would assume constraining it to 2 pi minus epsilon for some epsilon is not constraining it in your, so how, how well are you assuming you're constraining it? Like, let me see if I have the plot here. Yeah, so I actually, in the original paper, we discussed uh, several different constraining. So that's sigma here. Uh, yeah, that sigma zeta there is the uncertainty of how well you constrain either five degree, 10 degree, 20 degrees, and depending on which case you, you consider, it introduce you different level of bias. Okay, thank you. Asia. So this is maybe like a philosophical question. So one of the nice things about the standard siren thing is it only depends on fundamental physics and there is 
there's no more model dependence in it but when you start including things like you know how does the uh, em electromagnetic emission depend on angle and trying to like fold that into the measurement process then can you trust a measurement of h not you get that depends on that exactly so that's my worry <laughs> so that's the, but the problem is that we currently it seems that we cannot get rid of that like like yeah you can say oh i don't try i don't trust the the inclination angle inference from the em side fine but but the second systematic i i mentioned is that even if you don't use that information it just intrinsically your sample is already selected by your em model but like would it be for example like could you just cut out you know lose some selection power by picking only the samples which would have been detectable like you you throw out all the weak samples and keep only the ones that are your absolutely sure about and would you could you get around this that can be done if we do have some understanding of the em modeling right like if you like how do you define weak or strong like is it weak because your viewing angle is off or is it weak because some other reason like you have to when you do that already you are folding in some em modeling so that can be done if the EM modeling, like all the different EM model are predicting very similar behavior, like very similar dependency on the inclination angle, for example. But currently that is not the case, unfortunately. Like there are so many different geometry for the, say the Kionova emission. We don't have enough understanding for that yet. If they are more or less universal, then, then our problem will be much easier. Okay. Uh, Shinyu, can I ask you a related question here in Zoom? Uh, so would this also uh, mean that if you look at the gamma ray population, uh, there too we would need to know what the opening angle is, and if we don't know what the GRB models are suggesting, that would be wrong too. Isn't that correct? I didn't it's capture just... the first part. You, you said we look at which population? Oh, the gamma ray burst population. The gamma ray burst. Only the short GRBs. If you only take into account the model, sorry, the population that is associated with short GRBs, you want the electromagnetic counterpart because you want to know what the where the galaxy is, correct? What the galaxy redshift is. So you mean if we try to conduct standard siren measurement with gamma ray burst? Correct. Yeah. Not, not, not the H naught. I don't think the H naught problem can be solved because you don't have, you won't have so many events within a redshift of, I don't know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. You won't have so many of them. However, I'm generally asking, this problem will continue to exist for cosmography, where we want to measure not just the Hubble parameter, but also dark energy equation of state and so on. If yeah. you don't know what the gamma ray opening angle model is, this bias will continue to exist. Yeah, exactly. So, so I'm worried about that as well. It's just, I'm, I'm using, yeah, it's exactly the same problem. What, uh, for the GRB, I, I hope things will be easier for GRB because GRB, at least we, we, we can infer the, the opening angle from jet break. And that is slightly more solid than our understanding of the geometry of Kionova, which is messy. So hopefully when we get to that higher redshift state in, in 3G, then we also have a better control of the the GRB samples and we don't, we no longer suffer from this problem. That's my hope. Yeah, but we have seen one system in, in which uh, uh, we have seen this. I mean, this is actually a completely off axis jet. One doesn't know whether the jets will be similar in all GRBs and especially with respect to off axis observations, you know, th these are again, model dependent is all I'm saying that you have to know the model and whether we know, we will know the model is the big question. Yeah, 
I agree. So I wanted to follow up actually on Satya's question a little bit. So it, it almost seems to me like the gamma ray bursts are the harder case, not the easier case, because kilonova are probably roughly isotropic. So maybe the selection factor isn't like, you know, a step function. Whereas with the GRBs outside of the jet opening angle, you just don't see them at all. And so it seems like that might be a more severe selection effect. So I guess I have two questions. One is, um, you know, do, is, is that the one where the systematics are more severe? And then also how many measurements of the jet opening angle have we actually gotten so far from um, like jet break? I thought I the answer was 10 or something, 10, 10 or 20 with uh, entire sample, maybe less than that, maybe all of 10 only. So maybe around 10 for the GRB we have, short GRB we have good, uh, SMA, not good. We have some SMA of yeah. the jet opening angle. So yeah, certainly, like if if you are relying only on the GRB sample, it will you will certainly suffer more severe on this this systematics. Mm -hmm. It's just that GRB jet break is something that long GRB community are have been conducting mm. for a long time, and hopefully we don't. Well, we still need to consider what Sasia just said, the, the off-axis emissions. Right. We don't know if the samples we are obtaining at Reshef 1, do they still, were they contaminated by those off-axis mm. emission? Yeah. Right. So in um, that sense, I wouldn't say, yeah, I don't know which one is easier, actually. Just to quickly follow up on that, uh, for those jet break estimates, the uh, jet break measurements that have been done, does it seem like it's consistent from GRB to GRB? Because it seems to me like that could be highly variable. Um, yeah, there's a distribution, but I think we have something like 10 degrees within 10 degrees, 15 degrees. Maybe there is an outlier at 30 degrees, something like that, but mostly around 10 degrees. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so maybe I missed it, but I, I was wondering if um, in future uh, future facilities, if we get to see, you know, uh, you know, very distant uh, but long-lived uh, waveforms, uh, is there some other way of uh, extracting information about the Hubble rate from the details of the waveform itself? Ah, I see. So one possible that that's been one possibility that people races to try to use the, the, the tidal information, for example. So I don't know if Phil mentioned that. So for the, let's say you have a neutron star mergers and we have enough understanding of the equational state of the neutron star. We know that uh, uh, what kind of tides you should observe for a given mass of the, the, the stars. Then um, that mass, given mass, is the given intrinsic mass, the real mass, the source frame mass. Then from that, you compare it to what you receive in your detector, which is a redshifted detector frame mass. Comparing the two, you get the redshift information. And this can just always come with the event. Then that, that gives you the both, both of information. You can possibly um, constrain the Hubble constant or actually cosmological parameters. Well. Thanks. Yeah. Sathya, your hand's still up. Do you have another question? Yeah, no, I raised again, just to comment on that. It, it turns out that you can also measure the redshift as we discussed yesterday. I don't know if the person who asked the question was there yesterday or not. We can measure it from uh, the tidal deformability itself both from the in-spiral part as well as from the post-merger wave, uh, we can determine what it is. Unfortunately, measuring uh, redshift from purely gravitational ray observations of binary neutron stars is, is not going to be well constrained. We are writing a, a short paper on that because it's really a negative result. Uh, we were very much hoping at least up to 300 megaparsec or 500 megaparsec, which is where it's not is really important we might be able to do it. But uh, so far, it doesn't seem very bright. The prospects are not really bright. Yeah. 
I agree. So I kind of feel like the bright, I don't know if you, Sasia or other people agree with me, but I think the bright siren will possibly produce the, well, the most precise measurement, but I don't know how long, how many years we are going to fight for the systematics. All these other approach that is not as precise as the bright siren, they can possibly give us different route to to resolve or understand the systematic in our in our measurement. So that is the main value I view all these different other approaches. I, I, I would add that on the I, I think I am agreeing with you fundamentally at a fundamental level. The only possibility is that uh, the binary neutron star rates are really low. In that case, disappointingly low. In that case, um, what happens is when you make a, a single measurement of a binary black hole that can identify the host is also the one for which the distance is also measured extremely well. So in that case, a couple of sources with uh, A plus sensitivity or even beyond might be able to measure the Hubble constant to the same level. However, uh, this really is assuming that, oh, you know, the binary neutron star rate is at the lower end, something like 50 or uh, 25 or 50 per year per gigaparsec. century. I don't think it is going to be so low. I'm, I'm at least not hoping it to be so low. But if it is, then we have another avenue. Other questions? So I'm often curious, you know, a lot of work is done in cross-correlating different kinds of measurements of large-scale structure, CMB, lensing maps, uh, maybe eventually intensity maps, cross-correlated with surveys. Do you see or know of any promising directions where one might take all of the future binary black hole, binary star observations, and somehow cross-correlate them with large-scale structure or surveys, aside from the dark siren measurement, something maybe a little bit different in order to understand cosmological, uh, uh, cosmological parameters. Yeah, so there is a, a very comprehensive study done by uh, Suvadip. And uh, they, I think, um, so yes, that is doable. Possibly we still need something more sensitive so that we have good uh, localization. Um, the, I don't have the number in mind, which is how, how precise or how many number of um, detection you will need. But I think they are talking about at least five years of design sensitivity uh, operations so that you can get enough number of binary black hole mergers uh, and some information out from this um, large scale structure mm -hmm. cross correlation. And also you need to take care of the uh, systematic there as well. Thank you. Any last questions? We're just about at the end of the day. Yeah. Sorry, so these five years of observations, what will they result in, like in terms of? What was the question? So this is just to sort of ask based on like just following up on Aaron's question. You oh. said, uh, you referred to a paper and said that with five years of observations, you can achieve something. Like, yeah, what just is that? Yeah, started to get information, but whether that will be competitive to Galaxy Survey and all these other surveys, that I that I don't know. I, I don't I don't have the number. Yeah. Any last questions from the room or from Zoom? Well, if not, um, let's thank both Sunyu, all the other speakers of the session, and our microphone runners. Thank you very much. Thank you.